Alright everybody, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be talking about water chemistry. Water chemistry is often overlooked in terms of what's in beer. People often pay a lot of attention to things like hops, malt, and yeast, but water makes up 97% of a beer and affects every single aspect of it. So much so that John Palmer wrote an entire book on it. So why is it that we ignore it? Probably because most times when people try to explain it, they end up diving too deep into it. It gets very complicated very fast. People get confused and they don't want to learn any more about it. Completely understandable. So today we're going to try and keep it simple. Pretty much every homebrew channel on YouTube has one of these videos already. So this is mine. Um, but it's actually, well, it's my second one actually because my first one kind of didn't really cover all the bases. It has some good information, so I'm going to leave it up on my channel, but it's really old and I can do a lot better. Uh, water chemistry is definitely a very intimidating thing for a new home brewer to look at at first. However, I guarantee you it's worth your time because A, it's not actually as complicated as it first looks, and B, it has a massive impact on the quality of your beer. Alright, well we're going to try and keep everything as, as high level as possible and as simple as possible during the explanations. Hopefully by the end of this video you know what each individual ion will do to your brewing water and how it will affect your final beer. You'll know how to develop your own water profile how to make adjustments to your brewing water, and how to measure and adjust your pH during the mash. So let's start with the basics. Before we even talk about the chemistry though, and the salts and stuff, let's start with chlorine. Chlorine and another related set of chemicals called chloramines are found commonly in municipal water systems. These help keep the water sanitary and clean and free of organic matter in general. However, both of them are generally going to wreck your beer flavor. It generally manifests as a rubber hose type flavor, which is obviously not a great thing. The good news is it's very easy to get rid of either of them. If you have only chlorine in your water, just simply let your water sit out overnight prior to the mash and the chlorine will basically evaporate out of the water. Alternatively, you can also pre-boil your water and that should do the same thing. However, you can taste chlorine in your water, but you can't necessarily taste chloramines. So you might not know if you have them in your water until you brew. So there's two foolproof methods for getting rid of both chlorine and chloramines. And those are either using a carbon filter to filter out your mash water with, or using a Camden tablet, which is potassium metabisulfate. Both of those will effectively get rid of both chlorine and chloramines and leave you with good brewing water to work with. So now we're going to go ahead and dive a bit deeper, but don't get too worried if it starts to sound kind of complicated because there are calculators out here to help you work your way through this stuff. So this chemistry is just important for you to know uh, what you're actually going to be doing to the water and how it's going to affect the final beer. So there are six main ions that affect water chemistry in beer. Those are calcium, magnesium, sodium, chloride, sulfate, and bicarbonate. All of these are very commonly found in various kinds of salts, but we'll get to those in a minute. Calcium and magnesium, first of all, are important for mash efficiency and yeast health. You generally want about 10 to 50 parts per million of calcium and 3 to 20 parts per million of magnesium. Just keep in mind that mashing barley malt is actually going to provide you with a decent amount of magnesium, so don't feel like you have to go crazy on that. Next on the list is sodium, and that affects a lot of the mouthfeel characteristics of the beer. High levels of sodium tend to add a lot of roundness to the mouthfeel, and this is one of those reasons why German beers kind of have a very unique mouthfeel, is a lot of them are brewed with high levels of sodium. So if you want to take advantage of those characteristics, aim for about 25 to 50 parts per million of sodium in your brewing water. Next on the list are chloride and sulfate, and those are probably the single two most important ions in this entire bunch. And if you're not going to listen to anything else during this video, listen to this. You generally want to aim for about 25 to 50 parts per million for each of them, uh, but it's the ratio between them that is going to have the biggest impact on your beer, and that's going to be in terms of flavor and mouthfeel. So first of all, let's start with a high chloride to sulfate ratio. Um, so for example, let's look at a 3 to 1 ratio. So that would be about 150 parts per million of chloride versus 50 parts per million of sulfate. That's going to make your beer taste maltier, rounder, and uh, generally just a fuller feeling in the mouth. This is obviously going to push the malt flavors of beer forward quite a bit, and it's good for styles of beer such as stouts, brown ales, porters, and Belgian beers. Uh, as well as also hazy New England IPAs, believe it or not, uh, actually benefit quite a bit from this type of water profile. On the flip side, a high sulfate to chloride ratio, so let's for example use 4 or 5 to 1 in this case, that's going to be about 200 to 250 parts per million of sulfate versus 50 parts per million of chloride. That is going to make your beer taste hoppier, a lot more bitter, brighter, and also drier finishing. And so this is a very good type of water profile for things like obviously hop forward beers like traditional pale ales and IPAs, as well as English bitters and hoppy lagers. 
Keep in mind, however, that you don't necessarily need to have always a high ratio of chloride or sulfate relative to the other. You can also have a very good result with a balanced profile or just a gentle bias on either one of these ions. The last ion to think about is bicarbonate. That's generally going to affect your mash pH and alkalinity and beer color. Generally, you'll think about this in terms of beer color uh, because the darker your grist, the more residual alkalinity you need to add. And what that basically boils down to is the more dark malts you have, the more roasted malts you have in your grist, the more bicarbonate concentration you need in your brewing water. Generally, you'll see anything from about 50 to 250 parts per million, depending on what you're brewing. Another thing to keep in mind is that oftentimes you'll see water profiles listed for historic beer brewing cities like Dortmund or London, Munich, etc. And you'll see those water profiles listed and oftentimes I would actually advise you to stay away from them. It doesn't really matter how old they are or wherever they are in the world, breweries typically will adjust whatever water supply they have to work with the beers they're brewing. It just makes sense. Just use the city's water profile as kind of a general guideline for what you're using, but I would do the due diligence of just looking up an appropriate water profile or trying to design your own for the beer that you're brewing. That being said, there are some styles of beer that have very specific types of water profile. A couple of styles to come to mind, first of all, Gozes. Gozes need an absolute ton of sodium in their water profile in order to be authentic. Also, uh, things like pale lagers need a very soft water, a water that doesn't have much minerality at all in order to become really the best that they can be. And English beers, on the flip side, tend to do very, very well in high minerality water. So how do we actually go ahead and manipulate these ions in the first place? Well, they're actually found in very common cheap salts. And as long as you get the food grade version of all of these salts, you should be good to go. So basically it's very easy to break these down. Gypsum is the first one that will increase calcium and sulfate levels. Epsom is the next one that increases magnesium and sulfate. Uh, non iodized table salt. So something like a kosher salt is usually a good pick here that increases sodium and chloride. Calcium chloride, which is actually a kind of the base of rock salt or ice melt, um, that's going to increase calcium and chloride, obviously. And then last but certainly not least is baking soda, which increases your sodium and bicarbonate levels. Uh, so sometimes you're also going to see calcium carbonate or chalk listed here. I would highly advise not using chalk to adjust your water because it tends not to dissolve. Um, unless it is actually introduced into highly carbonated water first, the bonds between calcium and carbonate are very, very difficult to break. And essentially, you're not going to actually do anything to your brewing water when you try to add chalk to it. It's going to just precipitate out and not have really that much of an effect on your beer. So just try to avoid using it in general. The next piece of water chemistry is mash pH. pH is simply a scale of how acidic something is to how alkaline or how basic it is. On a scale of 0 to 14, with 7 being the dead center of it, being absolute neutral. Um, so anything below 7 is going to be considered acidic and anything above 7 is going to be considered alkaline. Uh, just keep in mind though that this is actually not a linear scale, it's more of a logarithmic scale. What that means is that every step on the scale is 10 times more acidic or basic than the step beforehand. So for example, a pH of 5 is actually 10 times more acidic than a pH of 6. So if you have a mash pH of 5.0, that is going to be massively different than a mash pH of 5.5. Your ideal mash pH range is actually 5.2 to 5.6. And if you end up outside of that range, it could have bad effects on your beer. Generally, it means you'll have a reduced mash efficiency, and it also generally means that your beer is probably not gonna taste the way you want it to. Mash pH is most generally affected by the malt that you're adding to the mash, as well as the ions that I just mentioned earlier. Um, sometimes it will require adjustment once you mash in. In most cases, if you have an appropriate amount of bicarbonate in your water profile relative to the color of your beer, your mash pH is going to probably be on target. However, if you have high levels of, of calcium and magnesium to begin with, you may end up lowering your pH initially and needing to raise it in the mash. And of course, if you have high bicarbonates in your water already, you may end up needing to acidify your mash uh, in order to make sure that it's in balance. In most cases, if the pH is too low, it's easiest to add baking soda to raise the pH a little bit, assuming you don't have a ton of sodium already in your water profile. And on the flip side, if it's too high, the most common way to adjust this is either lactic acid or a small amount of acidulated malt built into the grain bill already. 
Uh, but it's checking it is very easy, just five or ten minutes after you actually mash in, just pull a sample and check it with a calibrated pH meter. Um, these used to be really, really expensive and I didn't buy one for a long time, but I currently own a $50 pH meter. I'm going to link that in the description right now actually so you can go check that out if you want to. It works fantastically so long as you keep it calibrated and it's not a $250 pH meter, so there's no need to go absolutely crazy with that stuff. If you want a really general but not super reliable way to check your pH, pH strips are extremely cheap and they work reasonably well. But I wouldn't really rely on them for the long term. Um, sorry, so now we're going to talk about our starting water. And uh, if you're planning on using reverse osmosis or RO water, or if you're planning on using distilled water, just skip to this timestamp right here. Otherwise, if you want to learn how to use your own home's tap water, continue watching. All right, so knowing your city's water profile is probably going to be the most important piece to starting out building your brewing water profile. In most cases, towns will have their water reports published and available for free online, but this is going to change throughout the seasons, and it's also only measured as it leaves the water treatment plant, not as it actually arrives into your home. So you may have miles and miles and miles of pipes that it's traveling through, picking up other various types of minerals. So it's generally not a bad idea just to go the extra mile and buy a simple water testing kit for yourself uh, or take a sample of your water and send it into a lab to be analyzed. Either option is not really too expensive, but it's going to give you the most accurate results and I would recommend doing it probably about twice a year. My recommendation is if you want an at-home testing kit, use Lamont, and if you want to send your water into a lab, go with Ward Labs. I'm going to link both of those in the description as well. In most cases, if your tap water actually tastes pretty good, you're probably going to make decent beer with it or be able to build a decent water profile off of it. But if it starts tasting pretty strongly with things like iron or copper or chlorine, you might want to look into starting a reverse osmosis system or getting some distilled water to brew with. I have been using distilled water to build my brewing water profiles off of for the last several months now and it has been fantastic. I have basically the ability to customize my water profile to my heart's delight and it's consistent all year round. I definitely believe that's probably the best method in general if you want consistency and the ability to do whatever you want with your water. Distilled and reverse osmosis water both have pretty much negligible amounts of materials in them and a neutral pH of 7 which makes it very very easy to customize. Um, neither of these solutions are particularly cheap compared to tap water, but they are consistent. Alright, so I keep talking about how there's calculators available for all this, so let's definitely just do this as a practical exercise right now. I will point you toward what I consider to be the best water profile calculator available, and that is the Brewer's Friend Advanced Mash Chemistry and Water Calculator. Beersmith also has one, and its strength is that it calculates the salt additions for you based on whatever water profile you actually want, but the Beersmith interface is honestly kind of clunky and awkward, and I just prefer to use Brewer's Friend. Also, Beersmith is not so awesome about just showing you straight up what the pH is going to be. So in this case, let's pretend that we're going to be making a New England IPA. So we start by going down to the water volumes tab here, and we're going to go ahead and enter how much water we actually use. So I have, in my case, eight gallons of distilled water. And if you do a uh, all-in-one BIAB system like I do, you're just going to go ahead and do eight gallons of mash water. And your total water volume is still going to be eight gallons. Now you go down to the source profile here, and with distilled water, everything's going to be zero. And you're also only going to have seven as a pH. Now before we go ahead and play around with salts, let's actually go back down to our grist info tab here. Now we could throw in each malt if we wanted to, and that would definitely be a good idea if I wanted to say use acidulated malt in something or was brewing something dark and roasty. But in this case, color is all we need to worry about. So let's go ahead and put in 15 pounds of grain and five SRM for our color. Since it's a New England IPA, it's gonna be pretty pale. Next, let's go to our water target selection tab here. Uh, I really like to use some of these water profiles that are dropped down here. You have a number of really good options for just a bunch of basic beers here. In this case, we're doing a New England IPA, and you might think it might actually fall under light colored and hoppy, but in fact, it falls under light colored and malty because of that juicy character instead of an actual bitter hop character. So we're gonna go ahead and select that. So then, as you can see, it pre-populates our ion counts with something that makes sense. So now what we're gonna have to do here is just play around with the salt addition section until we have something that somewhat resembles the water profile that is targeted up here. 
So first of all, let's say I'm looking at this and I see that I need a decent amount of calcium and lots of chloride. So that tells me that calcium chloride is a good easy place to start. In most cases, dihydrate calcium chloride is what you're going to have. So I usually just use this. So if we need a lot of it, let's say, well, let's start with six grams. So as you can see, this is now updated up here. Next, I'm going to need a little magnesium and a little more sulfate. So let's go ahead and add two grams of Epsom, which is magnesium sulfate. All right, so I have a little sulfate left to make up right now. Uh, and we might want to add some calcium sulfate to do that. Now, you want to look at your calcium level first. And right now, we're pretty close to where we want to be. But if we go over by a little bit, it's not going to be a problem. So let's go ahead and use some calcium sulfate to make up that last bit of sulfate. And calcium sulfate is your gypsum. So let's go ahead and add maybe a touch of it. Uh, two grams sounds good to me. And there you go. Now we're actually on target with sulfate and calcium. Looking at this profile right now, everything looks okay, uh, but the chloride to sulfate ratio has kind of been dulled now. So at this point, you have a lot more balanced of a profile than we were actually going for. So we need to add a little bit more chloride now to make sure that we have that ratio of probably about two to one chloride to sulfate. So looking at this profile, I see I have some room to make up here in sodium. So we could add maybe a little bit of sodium chloride or salt. Now, sodium chloride is actually pretty potent stuff, so I'm going to add only one gram. And there, now we see that we've pushed our chloride up a little bit higher than we wanted initially. However, 115 to 62 gets us around a 2 to 1 ratio, and that's what we wanted. So everything looks pretty good in the water profile now. So let's go ahead down and look at our calculated pH to see where we're at, and 5.39, 5.4. That's actually pretty awesome. Uh, so I don't think we need to add any sort of acid or alkalinity to this. It looks good across the board. Now, if I did need pH adjustments in this, I would use this section here to adjust for pH acid-wise. Um, so if I needed to bring the pH down, I would add a little bit of lactic acid here. So you could say, I have lactic acid, I have it at 65% strength. Let's add, you know, two grams of lactic acid to the mash. That brings it down a little bit. You know, you're gonna play around with that just as you played around with the salts. Now, if I wanted to change the pH such that I had to raise it, uh, in that case, I would recommend using baking soda in most times and say, okay, we're gonna add four grams of baking soda to the ash, and that is going to bring our pH up to 5.5, you know. But in our case, of course, we don't actually need that here. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of those. And of course, down here, uh, Brewer's Friend gives you a good indicator for how uh, normal your ion counts are. And uh, looks like we're good to go across the board. Now at this point, once you're good to go, we'll scroll back up here. We'll write down the uh, numbers of different concentrations of ions here and the amount of brewing salts to add to our mash water here. And then come brew day, all you have to do is measure out those salts and add them to your mash water as it heats up to give it some time to dissolve. And that's really all there is to it. It's really not that complicated in the long term, and the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. And I guarantee you, you're gonna like what it does to your beer if you haven't tried it yet. As always, feel free to like this video or dislike it if you want to, I really don't care. Um, but most importantly, if you have a question that I couldn't answer in the video, please drop it in the comment section down below and I'll do my best to answer it as best I can there. I'll typically publish a grain to glass video where I'm making beer about every two weeks, but I'll also sprinkle other informative videos like this one in amongst those grain to glass videos every so often. If you want more frequent updates though, feel free to follow me on Instagram at The Apartment Brewer on Instagram, as well as on my Patreon, which I'm going to link up here in the corner. There's a lot of additional video content over on that platform. Alright, thanks for watching guys, I do appreciate it. Until the next one, cheers.